So, dear colleagues, hello once again from Leipzig, at least virtually. And in my second lecture, we will talk about clinical applications of the 3D optic lighting. Do you see my disclosures the same as in my first talk? Some consulting honoraries and real reference customer from Philips. And I will talk about the perioperative use of 3D imaging of the aortic valve and the periprocedural use of 3D imaging of the aortic valve during transcatheter AV procedures, especially then focus on the basilica procedure. There are two publications which I want to mention. The first one is the last year uh, publication Nico Ara and colleagues, and where Professor Vegas from your institution is also one of the co authors about the guidelines for the use of TE in surgical decision making in the OR. And the next is an article from Alain Baribi, published 2019, about the systemic echocardiographic assessment of aortic valve. What should the surgeon know for aortic valve repair? And if we go to that guidelines, there are three key points for pre-surgical assessment of aortic valve. One is evaluate AV anatomy, of course, with 3D, especially for the cusp, the coarctation height, and the diameters. The limitation is, of course, spatial and temporal resolution, which I addressed in my uh, previous talk. The next one is identifying the coronary artery osteos, also with 3D. Once again, special spatial and temporal resolution might be a problem, and post-processing is required. And then evaluate AV functions, especially the 3D aortic valve area planimetry and the use of color doppler. And all the other things you can see here is 3D not mentioned. So starting with the evaluation of AV anatomy of the palpation, you see in the image, in the 3D image display, you can rotate your uh, image of the aortic valve by 45 degrees, and then you can display it like a surgical view. It's the same for the metal valve, where you have a surgical view of the metal. By rotating your AV short axis image by 45 degree, degrees, you will get a surgical view of the right coronary cusp here, the non coronary cusp there, and the left coronary here. That is also where the anesthesiologist will see the aortic valve if they look from ahead of the patient. And with 3D, sometimes you can really detect small rafa like here, which was mentioned in the article from Araby, which you of course cannot see in the AV short axis view because uh, of the lacking elevation graph. And this is a example from our institution where you may detect something which was not so good visible in 2D. And this is a patient um, or coming for a redo, aortic valve replacement, where of course uh, there was a history of um, infection one year ago, and he, he come now came now to our institution with uh, aortic valve regurgitation, and you see here the explanted valve biopsies with a hole here in the right coronary cusp. And with 3D, you really can visualize that hole. So here. And if you tilt that image a little bit and you have it in systole, you see that hole also here on the right coronary cusp. That is really uh, sometimes an advantage over 2D. See that here uh, playing. Another advantage is was the alignment uh, of the non-coronary cusp and the left coronary cusp, which I showed you in one of the last slides in my previous talk. You can do that with multiplanar reconstruction, of course, where you set your image in plane here, 
crossing from the right coronary to the right coronary and non-coronary cusp, and here to the left coronary and cusp. Yeah. So that you can do with post-processing, processing, for example, using With that 3D, you can also measure the LVOT diameter and area. That is a view which you never get with 2D, but with 3D and NPR. It's easily to measure the LVOT diameter and area. And here, it's an example of measuring the diameter. Another thing which you can do with 3D images of the article is you measure each individual cusp of the aortic valve. And you measure the coaptation height, which is the height where two of the cusps really coap, and the effective height, which is the height from the tip of the cusp to the aortic annulus in diastole. Geometric height is this one here, where you have it from the annulus, from the hinge point to the tip. And you can measure that, of course, by using either multi-view multi here, and you can measure that live by adjusting the planes here. Adjusting that here, just rotating that 90 degrees to the short axis. Okay. And you turn it here. Image display and then you can do that, or you can use the uh, multiplanar reconstruction with the shown previously. And here it, it is. So here is just the MPR once again, and the red one here is enlarged, and you measure from the analyst the effective height and the partition height. Here, and you can do that with all of the three cusps by just adjusting that red um, plane from the middle of your right coronary cusp to the opposite commissure. You can measure effective and cooptation height of the right coronary cusp. You turn it to the non coronary cusp, and then you can measure it here again cooptation height and effective height. And last but not least, by turning that, you see it also from the left current. That is not possible in without 3D. So that is really a good advantage if the surgeon listened to that. And here are the recommendations and the parameters which you can uh, use for guidelines. So for the effective height, what to do, what are the surgical impl implications, and I won't go to that. Uh, in detail, but patient height should be after repair, if possible, more than five millimeters in each of the tasks, of course. Identifying the coronary arteries with 3D, you can do that, which I show you here. So once again, we use the MPR mode, and then you look for the left coronary osteum, which is depicted here and here, and then you go to the right coronary cusp, where you nicely can see the right coronary artery here, arising from the aortic sinus. So that is, again, using MPR, or you can use it with multiple view. You can also measure the distance from the aortic cusp to the coronary ostium, which is uh, very crucial for covers of basilica procedures, for, uh, which I will highlight at the end of my talk. And what we have discussed, the LVOT dimensions or the diameters. And you see that this um, has a good correlation with CT scan. That was a publication from 2010, the distance between the left and the right coronary as compared to the CT, or the left coronary it was significantly different in that publication, not uh, 
significantly different for the right coronary. We did uh, the same a few years ago, and we could show that there's no difference between measurements of left coronary or right coronary ostia compared using 3DT or CT. So in a very excellent correlation coefficient. Then coming to the evaluation of the AD function with using animetry of the odd path opening area or with the color gap and or with our degree vegetation, you see that here, you can really exactly identify the jets and you can do a planimetry of that. And here again, an example from our center. So here you have that patient with the orthic regurgitation and with the, with the MPR, you really can adjust the plane at the vena contractor. And here you have the 3D vena contractor area looking from the left ventricular outflow track view. There, that is the anterior mitral leaflet here. That is the regurgitation. And then you can also measure that here. And with MPR, you can measure the diameter, the area, which is here in German flag. So, and then you measure that in the still frame, and you really can adjust the aortic regurgitation. Get, see that here in MPR. And then measure either the vena contracta or the vena contracta area. As mentioned before, of course, you can measure the aortic valve opening area. And with that green bars, you really can adjust to be sure that you are on the tip of the cusps. And then you measure the area. These are the guidelines for the evaluation of uh, aortic regurgitation after percutaneous valve repair. So for replacement, that means after power. And you see, for TAVRs, as you all know, uh, not many centers still do TAVRs under general anesthesia. In, even in Canada or in North America, most of the centers switch to monitor anesthesia care, which makes the use of TE really difficult. And one possible advantage of using TE in these procedures is to evaluate the residual power valve on the leakage in a contractor area, and then you can really measure the area of, in, in, in case there are multiple paravalvular leaks, of all of the leakage, and then sum it up. This is, again, a image from our center, and you see here at the date, that is really um, years ago, where we use 3 dte for uh, evaluating the paravalvular leakage. And here is the grading. So always use the relationship of the whole circumference and then the circumference of the vena contractor area. We have that here. I don't think that this really makes uh, it the method why, or it's an argument to, to do general anesthesia for Thomas. Where you need general anesthesia and where 3D, especially the explain mode, is really crucial is during the basilica procedure with this bioprosthetic or native or skeletal intentional laceration to prevent iatrogenic coronary artery obstruction. And this was published uh, this year from one of my senior consultants. And that is the basilica animation. So you see that in case that you fear that during TAVR, the coronary ostium gets obstructed, you use a catheter here and beating hard to slice the cusp so that you have a V-form. And that should be in the direction of the left coronary ostium. And then after TAVR implantation, you see that after basilica, there's no risk of obstruction of the coronary artery after that. So and how do you do that? It's mainly focused on the multiplane 
method or the explain method, where you see at the first step, the positioning of the snare system. Here you see the aorta, here's the LVT, the aortic valve, the native or a bioprosthesis. That is your catheter here, that is the left coronary ostium. And you see that, that this snare catheter should be here, like here in that scheme, should perforate your cusp really at the bottom of the native aortic annulus or really close to the bioprosthetic ring if in case there is a bioprosthesis in place. So, and then you catch the, the catheters and just confirm that, that your traversal catheter is really at traversing the aortic cusp at the bottom of the um, a ring of the bioprosthesis ring and confirm. I can explain. You see here that is your sector. Here, the left main, and here you have the tip of the catheter really next to your coronary ostium. So, and then you, you can see that the traversal catheter has crossed that cusp, is positioned in the LVT and not in the left atrium, which can happen. Uh, it's rare, but you should have to exclude that. Because otherwise, if you then do really the slicing, you would slice the aortic root. That would not thing to do. And with 3D visualization, yes, you can do that. Sometimes you see here the coronary ostium, you see here the tip of the catheter and the struts. But again, for daily practice, I would say we use 90% of the time the explain mode. So to conclude, 3D imaging of the aortic valve allows unique imaging planes. It provides helpful measurements, especially of the aortic valve for aortic valve repair. It allows quantification of residual aortic regurgitation after aortic valve repair and accurate measurements of vena contractor and vena contractor area after tarver and after, of course, surgical aortic valve replacement. <clears throat> Sorry. And explain is usual for guidance, useful for guidance in basilica procedure. And as I mentioned in my first talk, next year we plan to have a live transmission also from the Basilica procedure where you can see TE masters, how they do the uh, echo very operatively, how they do the knobologies and which uh, images result, will result after a perfect knobology. So thank you once again for your attention.